And I started to really like grow the business because I had a bigger market now and a more readily available market, you know, as you do selling to college kids is yeah. a pretty easy <laughs> proposition, right? Figure out we can make triple our money, triple our profit by sending it to the East Coast, to New England, New York. So now you're trafficking. Now we're trafficking. Now we're really in it. And that's how we blow the business up and, and you know, make millions before, you know, I take my inevitable fall. Hey, what is funny. up? <laughs> Too funny face, pretty good. Yes, sir. Look at this. Keep it right. Right. How are you, man? When'd you get this thing? A couple weeks ago. Wow. Oh, I know. It's a spaceship. All right, here we are. We are joined today by YouTube legend. He has 833,000 oh. subscribers and 420 million views in less than a year mm. with the show The Connect with Johnny Mitchell. It's Johnny Mitchell. Hey, what's up, man? Cheers, Thank buddy. Thank you, dude. Yeah. How does it feel to be in the presence of a legend? I know. How <laughs> exciting. You know, I've known a little bit about your story through stand-up comedy, but now that you've got this YouTube show, you're you're pretty much an open book, it seems. Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I was talking about what I went through, right, with, you know, being a drug dealer back in the day, back when pot was a drug and going to prison and all that. I got, I'd done it in joke form, yeah. you know, it, it, on stage throughout the years. So comedians kind of knew about it. They were, wasn't really sure if I was joking some of the times or not, right? You never know. Yeah, you never know what's the exaggeration. Yeah. But is he yeah. a felon or did he yeah. just go to a county jail for the weekend? Right, exactly. So last year I had this idea, right? Like I'd been podcasting for a while since the pandemic. I'd tried a couple of comedy podcasts and I just thought, you know what? I got so many good stories from that era. And you know, like I'm flipping through my YouTube algorithm, right? And I'm hooked on like these drug and crime videos, you know, and it's some like Cholo with a, you know, a, a spider web on his neck telling him, telling us about like the craziest shit he saw in a Mexican prison or something like that. So obviously I'm clicking on that video, right? So I thought, what if I could do that and tell my own story, but articulate it in the way that I do? You know what I mean? Right. <clears throat> College boy. Plus, you've got boy ten like. years of stand-up experience, ten plus years. Yeah. Where you're you're learning how to talk on stage. Yeah. Tell stories in a way that kind of really can hit hard. And yeah. Stuff. Exactly. So I had experience with that. So I was like, what if we did this kind of prison drug true crime content, but professionalized it? And so that was the idea. So <clears throat> it was just a two-man shop at that time. It was me and my producer. And so we just started at the beginning. What is it like to traffic marijuana? Then versus now. Boom. Go. And, you know, we kind of just winged it at the beginning. And, but it looked like it was fully scripted because it was so... The narratives fit together so well. But that was just because it was my story. And I, you know... Uh, you know, knew it perfectly, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People think there's some secret behind the algorithm, but it really is watch time and will people click on what you're talking about? Yeah. So yeah. you've got a different, you've got a very interesting story here. Now, yeah. I want to talk about the content creating, and I don't want to ask a whole bunch of questions, but I do want to catch my audience up a little bit. So you get into, so let's just quickly go through it. You were, first of all, you were on Flagrant the uh, podcast, which was mm -hmm. a brilliant conversation. Thanks, so if people want like a deep dive into all of the, all of the things that happened to you by getting caught and all of that. That's a great place to start. Yeah. I know you're going to be on Rogan soon. I mean, you have to be, right? Yeah, maybe. That we'll feels see. like the next step. Yeah, it could happen. I, I was on uh, Tom Segura's podcast. That was huge. It was on your mom's house, which was a lot of fun. So, you and, know. And, and people don't realize this is bigger than getting on Dateline at this point. You yeah. Know what I mean, like, this yeah. is bigger. Like, getting on these podcasts is huge. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to re, you know, uh, Gertrude. Tread. Yeah, all these yeah. things people have said. But basically, how does it how does it work? You, you, you get started realizing you can make some money in college and then you just blow it up? Exactly. Well, high school, really. I was, you know, I was always a pothead. So like many kids back then in the, you know, 90s and the 2000s, you know, we were just like addicted to weed and rap music. And, you know, we were wannabe whatever criminals right so but I was never like dude I was never from poverty my father was a lawyer like I had a very I had a very good childhood you know and the older I get the more I realize that but you know you start out selling bags right mm -hmm. just to be able to smoke for free and back in Portland Oregon where I'm from that was uh, that was part of the culture you know that's where all of the weed before it became legal everywhere that's where the majority of weed in the United States comes from is Oregon in Northern California. So yeah, I just start out selling it, 
seeing if there's something something else to to this. There's got to be some way, because I found out, you know, we knew guys in my neighborhood that would figure out a way to actually do that for a living. It didn't have to have like a day job. You're just a capitalist. Dude. Dude, but when I found that, but I didn't even think of myself as a capitalist. I was like, I felt like I was anti-capitalist. I'm like, a, I'm not working for the man, man. Yeah. Like I was doing it. My only goal back then was to not work. Yeah. I was just a lazy, I did it out of laziness, Dave. Right. Don't you see? Well, you see the margins that are there. You're like, okay, I can make money and it's not going to be a nine to five. Exactly. I'm like, if I could figure out a way to pay rent, that's all I would need. So that's, that was the motivation at the beginning. Uh, I get to college in Eugene. Uh, I went to the University of Oregon. and What is that, the Ducks? That's the Ducks. Okay. And I started to really, like, grow the business because I had a bigger market now and a more readily available market, you know, as you do. Selling drugs to college kids is yeah. a pretty easy <laughs> proposition, right? So, what, you know, I, I, I get connected with one of, the guy, one of the source, the guy who grows it down in southern Oregon. You know, these rednecks who live in the mountains and they just grow, you know, tons of the stuff every mm -hmm. year. And so that's how I move up from like being like a nickel and dimer to like being a wholesaler. And then, you know, years go on, we figure out we can make triple our money, triple our profit by sending it to the East Coast, to New England, New York. So now you're trafficking. Now we're trafficking. Now we're really in it. And that's how we blow the business up and, and you know, make millions before, you know, I take my inevitable fall. All cash. The people just all cash, Dave. Your... No Bitcoin back then. No <laughs> Bitcoin. No in Venmo these days. request. For yeah, me. exactly. And then, and then, and then again. I don't want to blow up your story because it's fantastic, but I just want to get through because other other people have mm -hmm. interviewed you already. And then you get busted essentially because they were able to smell the weed on the money coming back to you. Exactly. Exactly. So they actually never got me with any product. They it was a money laundering charge. So they traced a, they tracked a package of money that they discovered in one of these FedEx sorting facilities, because mm -hmm. that's how I was getting product and money back. I was using FedEx, UPS, and the US Mail. So they put one of these little tracking devices into the package and then just traced it and followed it all the way across the country to Oregon, where I picked it up. And that led them to the, you know, the rest is history. That you know, led them to everything. I just had a buddy who was uh, gambling send 10 grand, and I don't know why he's sending cash, but he sent 10 grand to his bookie and it didn't show up. Uh, the package showed up to the bookie with just like a couple like CDs in it. And the bookie wanted to kill him because he was like, yeah. what are you doing? You know what I mean? Are you like insulting me? And he's like, no, no, no. Someone in the facility must yeah. have taken the money. For sure. For sure. That happened uh, a couple of times. Actually, the U.S. mail, uh, I thought the package was just lost, right? Because it, it didn't, it stopped showing up in the tracking. And then it shows up like a month and a half later. I think it was like 20 grand. Uh, that was supposed to be in it, and it showed up empty, oh taped up and empty. So some post, some postman got an early retirement. You know, yeah, what I mean? <laughs> right. So yeah, that that does happen. So there's a method to do it to conceal it. Um, but yeah, it was really amateur hour. It's an embarrassing way to get caught. You know, I'll tell you that. So do you think they you were just getting lazy, or it was this guy getting lazy, not you? It was really them on the other end. You know, I felt like I had my shit pretty tight, but you know, it could could have been tighter. Like there was always like you you do this thing long enough and you start making so much money like you kind of you get you drift into a a comfort and you can never be comfortable in the drug game you always have to be paranoid yeah that's why it's such a stressful way to make money do you feel like now were you at the point where you were that stressed out and what was the dopamine feeling like when the when the money would come back like like how, oh, how were you even dealing with this heroin straight into your vein man like it was uh imagine like fifty thousand dollars just dumping out onto your desk as a 23 year old Jeez. kid and you that's like twice a week so what was your biggest sort of deal yeah probably like 50 g's would be the most i would have them send back and that would be for you know i would sell each pound for about 3500 bucks so that would be for like maybe 10 to 15 pounds, whatever that came out to. So you, so you don't get, so you, you finally get busted, but mm -hmm. they get you on, on trafficking or they get you on, um, money laundering. Yeah. You say mo but I actually had a, a, a drug charge prior to the charge, the money laundering charge that put me away in prison. Uh, my house, I was selling weed. This was a couple of years before, uh, I had a weed house in Portland and it got raided like good old fashioned, like police raided. 
And so that's how I got my first felony. So I was already walking on eggshells. I, I was on parole. And that was because you tried to do a deal with the cop? Was that the... It was uh, a kid wore a wire. Oh. Yeah, a kid wore a wire. You know, one of my best customers, he got caught, and then he just rolled on Snitched me. Snitched their way up. Exactly. And you and you never snitched on anybody, and that's why you had to do time. Mm-hmm. And how much time did you end, did you end up doing? I did uh, about 20 months. 20 months, mm -hmm. star, basketball player. Yeah, at the Oregon didn't, State Penitentiary. Didn't get stuck in any gangs because of basketball? Or yeah. Or? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I would have. Like, Oregon's a little more mellow than like doing time in like a California prison. So I don't know if I would have had to gang bang. I don't think it w I don't think gang bangers would have wanted me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't really think I'm good. You could be like the lookout. You're the tall guy who can. Right. By the way, so you're like six foot eight, right? Six six. Six six. Okay, just because they can't tell in here. Yeah, car, in but it's tough here. to be. It's tough to to gang bang when you're six six because you just stand out. Everything there's no subtlety. yeah. There's a lot of body they can get on you. And, and there's no there's no subtlety to what I do. Yeah, like I can't like. It's very difficult to like you know, sneak a weapon somewhere. Cause everybody's like, oh yeah, that fucking giant, giant Gumby man. Yeah, there's nothing. Is, uh, you know, committing a crime right now. That's so funny. So like, I could talk to you hours about yeah. this all. And, I, but I do want to relate it back to content creating. So you start this mm -hmm. new channel. At what point talking about this, first of all, were you afraid to talk about an industry that is pretty deadly out there? No, not anymore. Cause it's been, you know, a decade. So it's like, Every, everybody's long gone. Everybody you're, you're from the just, past is gone. You're not just in your little studio making videos. You've been to Colombia. You've talked yeah, to drug cartel that's true. Uh, folks. And, and there was no point in which you were like, or or did these people just want to talk because they wanted sort of this this world of clout? Well, most people want the clout. So I, I'm i not too worried, especially when they invite the interviews. I'm not too worried about it. Um, it's when we went and filmed in like the Tenderloin in San Francisco where we were literally just stealing footage from, you know, street corners that are filled with drug addicts. That's where I'm afraid, you know, because it's it's unregulated and nobody nobody wants us there. So you're pretty much selling a drug that is now legal to sell. What is mm -hmm. that feeling like? Do you do, I mean, are, I mean it sounds it sounds crazy to ask, but like you you lost you you spent several years of your t of your life yeah. Or, you know, dealing yeah. with the court system that mm -hmm. now people are profiting off of. Yeah, What's that yeah, feeling yeah. like? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't feel that bad for myself because that's also the way I was making all that money was that the, the laws made it illegal. And that's, therefore, I was able to, I could have never made millions of dollars just as a, a guy if drugs weren't legal. Right. I could never have made all that money if pot had been legal. Right. You see what I'm saying? So me having to do time, I was benefiting from those laws. So me having to go serve time under those laws, it's hypocritical. It's unfair of me to feel bad for myself. Right. Because I knew the system. I knew the game I was playing. So you so you get this crazy dopamine high from, from the dealing drugs. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the high from a good stand-up set? Yeah, it's, I would say stand-up's better. Really? Stand up, stand up's a better high because it's the degree of difficulty is so much higher. So I think both wear off after a while, um, but I would say stand up comedy overall is a better better dollar. I'd, I'd rather earn, you know, a hundred bucks doing comedy than a thousand dealing drugs. So you feel the pride of knowing that it's, yes. it's hard earned yes, versus absolutely. Now because I, I think both of us, I remember first meeting you maybe at the haha, -ha, but both of us have really kind of been in the trenches for a long time mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. At what point have you have you started to feel like your stride was stand up and feeling like you belong and have a place within the community because it is so competitive? Yeah, well, I think I feel like I'm still battling it out. Like I've done Flagrant, I've done Your Mom's House, I have you know 400 million views, and I'm still battling for spots when I'm in town. So you know, I feel like that's my next step is to prove that I am the real deal when it comes to stand up. You know, and stand up. So I, my content is stand up adjacent, you know, mm -hmm. entertainment news. Right. Your content is storytelling. Yeah. But that's adjacent to stand up as well. Yeah. Are you are you finding it difficult, or what's your process for kind of converting yeah. YouTube audience to sitting yeah. to yeah. fans? No, it's a good question. I mean, the the idea is just to keep doing comedy and keep dropping in comedy along with the connect and people that like the connect that also happen to like comedy. Well, the idea is then they come over 
to the comedy. They come out and see a show. So you're almost like a drug dealer again. You're like, all right, well, you bought this. Now yeah. Try some of this other. Exactly. Product exactly. And and you know, it's you can't expect the stand up to happen as fast as the connect blew up, right? Um, but that's okay. Well, let's talk about the connect blowing up. So a lot of people struggle for years mm -hmm. uh, trying to get a foothold online, and you and you did until the connect. You've tried other different things. Mm -hmm. Did did you see this algorithm just hit one day, or was it like, oh shit, sixty subscribers? Oh shit, one hundred and fifty yeah. thousand? You know, like how? What was that process like? Because this really did grow right away. Yeah, yeah. It was the second episode. By the second episode, we knew we had something. So I saw we dropped the first, the very first episode of the connect is called. Marijuana trafficking then versus now, and I think we titled it something like salacious, like drug dealer, former drug dealer, right? Like I tried to title all of the videos with those pronouns, right? Like former drug trafficker, ex-convict, because those are just grabby. This is it's clickbait. That's what I'm doing. And they're, at the end and of the they're day. long enough videos that when when people watch YouTube, will just be like, "Hey, front of the line." Exactly. You become the hot chick at the nightclub. Exactly. Like, Fuck the line. Yeah. You go to the front, and yep. you can see like a wild yeah. sort of growth that you cannot yeah. get by telling anyone on the street corner to come watch you. Right. So, yeah, by the second episode we had, I noticed that we had a couple hundred subscribers and we were like, hey, look at that. We're growing. In a couple months we'll be eligible for monetization. And, uh, yeah, by before the third week, before the third episode had dropped, we had over 10,000 subscribers. I mean, it just, it just, it grew almost literally exponentially. Are these videos monetized? Because it's a he it's a heavy topic here. They, I think they were monetized uh, after we became eligible, and then a few of them fell out of monetization. And now, you know, now we struggle to get monetized. At the beginning, we were getting it was a lot easier. Um, I think, to be honest with you, I think politics has a lot to do with what YouTube chooses to monetize and what they don't. So, for for example, in January. Cartels started getting a lot of press uh, down in Mexico, you know, kidnapping tourists and killing them accidentally. Um, then there was a huge raid uh, where they arrested uh, Chapo's son, Ovidio. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff we noticed after that happened, whenever we put cartel content out, it started to become really difficult to get it monetized. Just like how during COVID, if you questioned anything that the government was doing that might have been against orthodoxy, you would find, I mean, you wouldn't get it monetized and you might even find your channel getting like strikes or something right. like that. Right. And it's not exactly a first amendment right because it's a private company yeah. and all that jazz, yeah. but it's encouraging creators not to talk about things. Totally. So you totally. couldn't say COVID. I covered with entertainment news, Johnny Depp versus Amber Heard. Mm -hmm. You could not say their names. You couldn't say them because Google would transcribe the closed captioning and they would just be blacklisted, blacklisted. Wow. And sure, the videos can get made, but then they're not going to get promoted. Right. You're not going to make money off right. of it. And if you're telling people to not talk about things that they should be able Able to talk, like we mm -hmm. should be able to talk about the Holocaust. Of course, it doesn't mean you're a denier. Yeah. you should be able to teach people on of that. Course. And yet, if you do talk about that, or if and you slavery. talk about sexual assault, yeah. any of these topics, yeah. you have to almost say in a way that's you have to like use fake yeah. or like different yeah. words to say that. Yeah, so it's the, it's the Orwellian double speak dystopia that you know everybody, every author, every philosopher from the 20th century predicted and warned about. So it's BS. So the the move now is to take the long form content, whether it monetizes or not, on YouTube, right? And make break it down into clips and put it onto TikTok, Facebook, and now Instagram, I heard this morning, was starting to introduce a monetization program. So the idea is to have it to fan have it fanned out on all different platforms. So it's like a stock, right? If one stock is down, I'm diversified. This one is up. Yeah. So we're we're always going to stay in the in the green that way or the black rather. Are you on a podcast and, um, as well. What's up? You on a, a podcast like audio yeah. form as well? Exactly. Exactly. So you know sponsors and things like that. So yeah, that's the, the the idea. I think the future of the content creation and podcasting uh, is is not going to favor these massive shows anymore. You're not going to see flagrant again. You're not going to see uh, certainly not going to see a guy like Rogan. Uh, the next Rogan happen on YouTube. Um, and it will, you know, that's to their detriment, right? Yeah. So perhaps one of these alternative companies 
will, you know, more and more people will go over there. Rumble, things like that. Um, but YouTube still is the beast, and it is the one still that the beast, got you of the big, you know, big following. Got me the you know, exposure. Totally. YouTube's one of the only apps that's installed on every Android device, which mm-hmm. is huge, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. So, what was your biggest month, if you don't mind me asking? Like, do you have a do you have a month where you looked at, or what, or, or uh, also? What, yeah, I think we did like like numbers wise. Yeah. I think numbers we did or like, monetization. I think we did like in uh, October, November, December. We did like twenty each. 20, 20 grand or more, and that was just off the monetization. You know, we all what do you also mean each, got, like between you and your partner? I'm or? sorry, uh, each month. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, and that doesn't even include like the sponsorships we got. Um, yeah, people don't realize YouTube's what's called AdSense. So YouTube, you get paid by Google. It is a direct deposit. So for me, the first few years of my show, I wasn't trying to get any, because the, the AdSense was paying me so well, I wasn't trying to make any other money. It was just like, I didn't have to worry if a check was going to bounce or if my podcast sponsor was going to pay me the wrong amount and chase down their money. So like, there is something very powerful about knowing that that money yeah. can come. But if you're doing a sensitive topic... Yeah, yeah. What I've learned is I don't want to rely on any of it. That's why... We're so excited for this new business model. And we're launching two new YouTube channels. Um, one of them is a little less edgy. Yeah. Uh, it'll involve more travel. And even though we will be weaving in, you know, crime and drug and drug cartels, it's also going to be travel and culture and, you know, music and things like that. Um, and then we're also, yeah, just a couple other ideas. And then the idea is just to be a content factory every day after day after day just 24 hours a day there's a clip dropping you know that's that's my business model is yeah make sure you give people something to tune into if they're ready to if they want to sit down to watch a a video if there's nothing to talk about find something Mm -hmm. which can be hard like today we we, we started this at 11 i had to get my podcast and a youtube video out yeah i normally have three out by then Wow. I've just had to learn that people that follow me, like find something to talk about and then stretch it and rely on the skills of a comedian to just make it interesting yeah. or just keep rambling, really. Yeah. yeah. And it kind of, it, you, and on one end, you're like, I don't want to waste people's time. But on the other, some people want their time wasted. They just want yeah. to hang out with their friend Johnny and of hear course. what he has to say about, yeah. you know, yeah. whatever's in the news regarding travel, the drug trade, whatever, yeah. whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. Totally. So, so were you able to, at what point? In your content, were you able able to think, oh, it's not necessarily the subject, but I am, it's my interpretation of the subject? I think when we, people, our views dropped after I quit telling my story. So I ran out of story. So, so once your story's over, which it's is a, a fantastic story. Thank you, thank you. And that lasted about 11 episodes. And we were averaging, you know, five, seven, eight hundred thousand view, views on the long videos. I mean, we're killing it, you know? Um, that's when I noticed that we had a drop-off. Um, the shorts are still killing it. Millions, you know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. No I mean, money in that, though, really, right? Not really anymore. But, so, I thought that was interesting. Like, people are, people don't want news, or at least on this channel, with the Connect. They wanted my story. They wanted me. And so, that, that was really, like, telling, Right? Are, you, are you going, are you mining? Are you like, shit, what else did I miss? Are you going through your journals? Or like, do you get it all? Or is there new ways to sort of tell your story? No, I, I've i felt like I've told it. Like, I don't want to go, I don't want to go back. Because sometimes you know? if you do like Q&As, sometimes people will ask you a question that you go, oh shit. Like, it's almost like with yeah. stand-up. We forget something that's super funny because yeah. it was just like, oh yeah, that happened to me. I shit my pants in an alley mm-hmm. in Barcelona. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is funny. I got mm-hmm. robbed the night before. Like, you start to remember right. things you didn't know. That happened know. to you? Shit your pants in an well, alley in Barcelona? I mean, things happen. <laughs> you were just in Barcelona, right? I was in Madrid. Madrid? Madrid, yeah. Time? Yeah, Madrid's great, man. That's slept on. I think it's less touristy. Than, uh, than Barcelona, and it's, like, still really cheap. Oh, good. So it's, like, I felt like I was getting third-world prices, but I was in Europe, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah, so anyway, it's, uh, sorry to, um, to sidetrack there. So you're in the process of figuring out how to apply the thing that worked, which was basically your story. With, yeah. Because, yeah. Because you're right. YouTube and content creating is about replication, right? Yeah. So I had a video take off and I had I said, how do I redo this style of video and get people to watch right. and this and that? And it's a question sometimes you got to ask yourself every day, you know, you're trying to make content is how can I replicate the success I already had? Because you're not a one hit wonder. 
you know? But, yeah. But your story is one that can live on evergreen, but what can you create moving forward? Exactly. So we have a, we have a plan to go back to kind of the original way that we shot the connect, but do it on a different channel and actually do it with different people. So I'm pretty excited for it. Yeah. And I, and you see with successful YouTubers and content creators, it is normal to have four or five, six channels Yeah. because you need to niche down and have each channel be something specific. Yeah. And then when people start to follow that channel, they're going to, YouTube's going to recommend your next thing because mm -hmm. it's a, it's one of the smartest algorithms yeah. that knows your name and it knows your That's face right. and it's going to give you a shot now that you've broken right. in with that. And you try to brand it similarly. Yeah. Like you try to, you, you know, the way the Nelk boys do it, you know, everything is like, it's like Nelk. Everything is Nelk, yeah. right? And so that's kind of, I think that's the way to do it, man. It's like essentially become a mini production studio. Yeah. That's that's the goal. And you see how much money you're taking away from, like when it, like I, I got into my channel because before the pandemic, I was interviewing for like, um, uh, what's it what, what's it called, uh, E! News. And I was like, I can do what these assholes are doing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I crushed it on the green screen interview. I had the teleprompter guy laughing. Then the world shuts down and I go, I don't need it. And then I was like, I don't even need the teleprompter. Get that out of there. Yeah. Let's just let's just start going. Right. And so I'm a big believer for comedians to do comedy adjacent things because there's a million jokes out there. There's a million crowd work clips yeah. out there. Keep yeah. doing that. Yeah. But also like you need to bring your the art of stand up to other places. Totally. And because di because that's what works online, and then yeah. people can come see you live. Yes. Yes, I agree. But I had no interest anymore in trying to compete with every single comedy podcast. I. I Really, I, I think it's, I don't know. I feel like it's past its time. I feel like the, the podcast, the comedy podcast bubble has had its time, truly. Uh, you know, the, 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 and it's like, do it if, it if it brings you joy, but it might not be the thing right. that, it's that cracks a, you into new audiences. Totally. I think it's very, I think the people that are doing well at it, they have such a stranglehold on the market. And even, you know, even those uh, numbers are starting to fray on some of the biggest comedians who are, you know, theater comedians, their numbers are taking a dip. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's just because there is so much competition. So I, I was like, we're going to go interesting. I want to be interesting first. Funny can follow. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I think you had a great idea with, uh, you know, your show is like, let's, let's be entertaining first. And then comedy can join. Yeah, and sometimes I have a heavy topic that I can't. I was talking about race bias yesterday with Instagram followers, and like, yeah. I'm like, we're not going to be cracking jokes yeah. on this one, but <laughs> right. I got to pay the bills. I got to fill up the gas tank, yeah. and then and then that affords me to do the. Well, you're in a Tesla, story. so there's no more uh, gas tank. Yeah, I mean, we're doing okay in the Tesla. <laughs> My first big purchase uh, with the YouTube channel. This guy like, doesn't need any money. He's unsubscribe. <laughs> He's good. I try to show up to comedy shows. My window's down now. Yeah, but I just want to see other comedians, yeah, and I'm like, what am sure. I in high school again? Yeah. <laughs> I want to, playing my music loud and everything. Uh, we'll let you go in a few minutes. I wanted to ask you about um, about how stand-up's been going since the uh, since the po mm. since the YouTube channel mm -hmm. because there is a critical mass that you need to like fly out to Des Moines. If you yeah. if you have ten people that want to see you, that might not get you a flight out there, but yeah. twenty five might. Mm -hmm. like, like, yeah. like I just saw you had shows in Buffalo and you got a bunch mm -hmm. probably coming up. What's the strategy yeah. been? Yeah, so I I will take. One line, one nighter headlining dates right now. Uh, even if I break even or even lose a little money, because that's like a loss leader to me. Meaning, I go out there, I kill or try to kill. Uh, I make the club happy. I try to sell some tickets. I get clips, and that feeds the beast. And that, in theory, gets me more followers and sells me more tickets the next time I'm out there. So I'm taking, I'm taking a, a three to five year view with stand up. Right. Right? Like I'm I'm not worried cuz when you first start headlining, you take you get shitty deals, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. And so I got a new agent and she's very good and she's you know getting me into festivals and she's you know getting me one nighters at comedy clubs and I'll and I'll go anywhere. Um and your comedy is not probably the type that that like um I don't know would be yeah, uh, network friendly. You know, it's a little edgy. No, no, so no, no. It's definitely you really edgier. have to like find your audience. Yeah, yeah. So, but I think that's the that's why you know the internet is such a godsend to people like me because I was never going to make it 
if I had relied on, you know, the business. Oh, yeah, the you Flappers know, Festival. They weren't going to take, I mean, <laughs> the Flappers Festival or, you know, what's left of late night TV. Or, Garbage. Like, there's nothing left. There's nothing left of the business. It looks good. Like, like a Conan set might get you a festival, like, look because you have a high quality video. But it's not. Like, Is that going to move tickets? People need no, to realize. So, no, it doesn't move tickets. And just like you, it's almost like we've left. Pro- it used to be you would feature, which is to do twenty to thirty minutes, yeah. and then in in the, someone would take you on the road, yeah. and then you would graduate to a headliner. I'm starting to book headlining gigs that I have to self produce because I wasn't. I, I, I missed that boat. I totally, I missed the feature stage. And I think like, I featured for like less than ten times for yeah, bigger comedians, yeah. and now I'm. There's no going back. Yeah, you know? and and um, so I'm doing Seattle and um, what's the other one? Huntington Beach, and it just shows that rooms that'll give me a door deal, which again is a percentage you can mm-hmm. go from. But one club just offered me fifty fifty, which is the worst you could imagine. Yeah. But like seventy tw- thirty eighty twenty, and then it's enough to fly to get you out there. It's a tax write off if you lose money, mm-hmm. you know. But I, for for a couple of years, I wasn't doing that because I was making so much money on YouTube yeah. that I'd be okay just doing five minute spots around town. And I've had to talk to my wife Tasha and be like, I need to get out there and just book the flight. I flew to Nashville to do a podcast a few months ago yeah. and did a few spots there where I made probably thirty bucks and spent a thousand. Mm-hmm. But like, you have to be able to get out there. Yeah. And like you said, content begets content. Yeah. So the more you're you're branching out, you're yeah. going to get appreciated outside of LA. And that seems to be the best, you know, you're, you're in a privileged place where you can afford to go to a yes, place, correct, risk it, and not correct. worry if you're going to cover rent that much. Because that's why, and that's why the content is just going like this, because then I, I'm able to do that. Because even if I'm losing money on a live show, the internet's never stop. The right. internet never stops. The internet game never stops. This content shit will never stop. Yeah, like, so, like people that can't make it to my Seattle show, I'll film it. I'll put it on Patreon. Yeah. You know, my YouTube stuff, yeah. my stand-up doesn't do well on YouTube anyway, so why give it away? I'll just make people can go get full sets. Sure. If sure. they want to. Yeah. Or, or I'll post the clips, but full sets can yeah. be made. Yeah, and, there um, you go. And this here, is the here. first time I'm doing a VIP. So I did a show with Katie Thurston. I think you met Katie Thurston. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's a good, she became a good friend because I cover The Bachelor and she was The Bachelorette. Yeah. And she and I co-produced a show in San Diego and she was like, let's do some VIP seats. I was like, listen, no one's going to be buying VIP, okay? It's just not going to work. Mm-hmm. And she was like, she was like, yeah, let's just give it a shot. If we don't sell those tickets, people can buy general admission. And sure enough, we sold out of the VIP, which pretty much doubled our door. And so I'm doing that in Seattle where I'm just offering people a koozie with a beer. It's it's a double ticket price, but I'm going to print out show posters, which, you know, cost me probably 50 cents mm-hmm. to print. And I'm like, all right, you know. There is, for your audience that does care about you, they do want to support you. Yeah. Like, no, like there's no, no, no gun to anyone's yeah. head. The yeah. people that want to support you that have the wherewithal to do it, fi- are, find ways to right. sell them new things. Yes, yes. Seems yeah, that's what, you hit, it on the, you hit it on the nose. Make them care about you. That's what it is. That's what, you know, that's what uh, which, entertainment which, by is. Which, TikTok does not do. You know, they had, they had the VidCon and TikTok stars with millions of views could not fill up a room that guys like me, I'm still under 70,000 views. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm making, you know, good six-figure income with only 70,000 um, subscribers. But YouTube and long-form content builds a relationship that short-form yes. just doesn't. Yes, yes. Exactly, exactly. So the idea is make them, make them love you, bring you in, make them the family on the, the long-form, uh, but make money on the short-form. You know, yeah. Like, let it all, you know, work in the like, one symbiotic way. Yeah, and it's not like one audience is stopping the other. You're just fishing. Correct. You're just fishing for new audience. That's right. And in the end, the the highest CPM of them all is if they will come to a stand up show. That's right. You know, because on YouTube, on a good on a good month, I'll make ten dollars per every thousand views. Mm-hmm. Um, with stand up, you can make twenty dollars per right. every per every one ticket sold. Right. So like, right. you you get to see the comics like Mark Norman when they sell out the Wilbur. On a weekend, you go, shit, you just made $150,000. Yeah, that's right. That's right. On the ticket sale that's alone, right. let alone merch and all that's the other right. things. That's right. So yeah. it makes perfect sense that you go to Buffalo and try to sell some tickets to a show. Yep. Oh, he's let me go. All right, good. But anyway, did it's I the leave hardest, any- This is the hardest left throw <laughs> yeah. in LA right there. Did I leave anything on the table with you? Because no, I really- I, f- I feel like we got it, man. I want to tell you, I really respect what you're doing. And to make an audience love you telling stories about your drug dealing days <laughs> yeah. is a real skill. Yeah. And, uh, you know, look forward to seeing where you're going. 
Um, what's the best way my audience can support you? Yeah, yeah, you? go check the Connect with Johnny Mitchell out on YouTube and as a podcast, uh, wherever you get podcasts. Um, you know, check me out on Instagram and TikTok at Mr. Johnny Mitchell. That's M R and my name, Johnny Mitchell. Um, you know, and then I'm coming out on the road, man. I'm booking a tour for, you know, Q3 and Q4. Uh, so check me out, man. I would love to have you at a show. And Dave, go, so good to see you, buddy. Yeah, man. You know, I remember I, I remember running into you before the Connect started. It was about a year and a half ago. and uh, I'm selling everyone on the internet. Like, bro, you <laughs> sold me, man. I'm like, dude, fuck the world. Well, I'm going in on the internet. Well, no one wants to talk about it and because we all want to hold on to what our, what's ours, but like you yeah. have the ability to flourish and I can and what yeah. we're doing is building an equity that we don't need to, you know, kiss the ass of the comedy clubs anymore. Yeah. You can just like whatever. Exactly. We, I'll exactly. score VFWs and die a happy man. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who cares? Well, you're a very, you know, you've reached this, this zen place in your life. You're in a very good, like I'm not there mentally. Yeah. You know, mentally I'm still, part of me still longs to be one of the gang, to be at the comedy store. Oh, no, I mean, I be, want that yeah. more than anything. I'm a, of my whole life, fraternity, yeah. football team. I yeah. still play in a baseball league. I want that more than anything, <laughs> but I just don't think they're going to give it to me. Yeah, right. I think I got to build my own thing. Accepting your limitations, accepting reality can make you uh, a whole new reality. Because yeah. when you just accept the way things are, then you can create based off that. Oh, yeah. Instead of longing. You don't you know think I, mean? I want my name on that wall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want yeah, all same. of that. I want all yeah. of that. I just, I don't see it being, I'm not going to be a door guy. I'm not going to be a door no. guy who waits to go through this process. Yeah, look what you're driving. I'm this 38. Door I got right. I'm trying exactly. to have a kid. Exactly. I, I um, and I think I, that uh, that following, I want to do it. I mean, Andrew Schultz was a club comic, but he, he obviously like built people that believed in him and yeah. kind of like dragged them along. Right. And I don't know. Um. I mean, no one wants more validation than I do with all of this, but I'll, I'll forever feel completely un, you know, unrespected. Is that a word? I don't feel like the love at all. Yeah. But I still go on stage and get it from my audience. Right. So I'm just like, all right, fine. And, and, that, and, and, is that, and is that maybe because we're all in L.A. and we're all pretty skilled people, you know? Yeah. Like, we're all, like we're all fighting for this position, even yeah. though there is more room at the table next door. We're all at this one table yeah. fighting. It's like, yeah. I'm going to go sit yeah. in the other room. No. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And now they're, now everybody can have their own table, you yeah. see? Like, that's the beauty of it is, like, there's no hierarchy hardly anymore. Yeah. Like, your, your hierarchy is what you create. Yeah. You just like it's it's flattened. It used to be like this, right? Yeah. And now it's it's just like this. But I think I think comics do respect that when they hear, when they hear oh so and so sold out the you know atrium whatever you know you, you, yeah. you hear and you go shit comics know what numbers those are and I'm not there but I think we do respect that when you see it when someone like Trevor Wallace just like blows up you go oh wow like you can command it at a mm -hmm. certain level when you have that equity yeah but I don't think I'm gonna get like that that verification from a comedy club before that happens yeah I'm just like I, I that I boat's agree. long gone I agree let's I just agree. find the comedy clubs yeah. here and you yeah know. exactly and once you're selling out you know every city in America. Yeah, you get to go do a 10 minute spot at the comedy store and uh, you know, you'll be like, oh, this is what I was, this is what I wanted all those years. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> this is it? Like the $10. Yeah. This is literally the checks that we've probably yeah. both cashed doing stuff like D DIY. And at the same time, we're, 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 you know, kicking each other to try to get this $7 check mm -hmm. yeah. from the improv. Yeah. 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 So. Well, well, hell luck, yeah, dude. Appreciate Fucking it. Great to see yeah, you, Dave. Good to I'm see glad, you, glad you had me on, man. Yeah, hopefully we'll do a show soon. Cool.